If you really want to get the sound man upset, change microphones. <laughs> Oh, dear. <laughs> oh, we're going to continue the theme of how great our God is with this song entitled Above and Beyond. <laughs> Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up. And seated on a throne The seraphim above him They covered their faces And one called to the other Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Above and beyond There is no one like him His glory fills the earth Above and beyond Glorious, magnificent Wonderful, so mighty The whole world shakes in awe He is above all else And beyond all words Jesus is above and beyond. And one day I will see him in all of his glory as he really is. With trials all behind me and nothing more to bind me, And praise Him and thank Him and glorify the King of Kings above and beyond. Holy, omnipotent, there is no one like Him. His glory fills the earth above and beyond. Wonderful, so mighty, the whole earth shakes in awe. He is above all else and beyond all words. Jesus is above and beyond. You, Almighty God. I worship you. I 
I worship you, O Prince of Peace. That is what I want to do. I give you praise, for you are my righteousness. I worship you. We have one more song. It's not in the bulletin. Um, it's called Seek Your Face. And we have a gentleman at the Pregnancy Care Center. His name is Phil Kleinfelter. And he is the Men of Honor director. He's also the chaplain of the jail. He is the sweetest guy. He comes in at all hours of the day and night to see people, whether they're prisoners or whether they're guys that are struggling to be better fathers, be better dads. He gives of himself so selfishly, selflessly. And there are times when he is there in the morning when we are, um, the Pregnancy Care Center gets together at a quarter till 10 every morning and we pray. And sometimes he's there and sometimes he's not. But I like it when he's there because he'll pray and he will, he will say things that it's like, wow, that's deep. And um, makes me think, even after the prayer, and one of the things that he has prayed before, and it just really made me think about it, he said, may we seek your face before we seek your hand. Mm -hmm. I thought, that is profound. How many times do we start praying and say, Lord, this person needs you, or this person needs you, or... I need this in my life, or Lord, I'm hurting, or I'm struggling, or God, how are we going to pay these bills? Instead of, we seek his hand first instead of his face, and he wants us to seek his face first. And the, to me, the best way to do that is to just tell him how wonderful he is and who he is, because he wants us to know who he is. There are hundreds, thousands of ways to describe God, and he loves it when we do that. And um, I know Cindy's class has done it, and I've done it too, and we've done it in a ladies' study, where you just say, Lord, you are, dot, 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 and you fill in the blank. Lord, you are creator. You are divine. You are supreme. You are royal. You are mighty. You are the king of kings. You are the Lord of lords. He wants us to seek his face first, and then his hand. So this song is called... We seek your face.
Great job, praise team. I'll ask you to turn your scriptures to Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is over towards the end of your Bible, between the book of Philemon and James. And if you find Philemon, congratulations. <clears throat> That's not an easy book to find. You have already found Hebrews if you find Philemon. We looked at the first three verses last week, but as a context of our reading, I'd like to go back and read the whole first chapter. So if you'd stand, me, stand with me as we reverence the reading of God's holy word. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So... He became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. In speaking to the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But about his son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above all your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, and like a garment they will be changed. But you will remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who inherit salvation? May God add blessing to the reading of his word this morning. For the writer of Hebrews, he is reminding the people, these Hebrew people, this one that we are testifying about, whom you have walked with and whom you have talked with, is indeed the son of God. Of God. It is He who has the mantle upon Him, who is the Son of God. And they needed to be reminded of that, and we need to be reminded of that. We need to be reminded that Jesus is higher than the angels. And to someone like me and you who have been a part of a study of Scripture that has been given to us some 2,000 years ago, we would, we would respond, duh. We all know that. We all believe that, that Jesus is higher than the angels. But to the people in the writing of Hebrews, this Jesus walked among them. They remember him as a carpenter's son and now as a carpenter 
who has now at the age of 30 given up his carpenter shop to become an itinerant pastor. And to begin to walk and to be able to talk and to be able to minister and to be able to teach and to preach in such awesome ways, they needed to know who he really was. You see, we can't correspond really with the, this passage for two reasons. The first reason is we have never seen an angel in all their glory. <coughs> And the Hebrew people grew up knowing that there are angels that had come into their presence and come into their midst. And every time you see an angel and a human come in contact with one another, there was one correlation, one thing that always happened. The human was terrified. Were petrified of this angel that had come into their presence. And we've not seen that. I've not seen an angel in all his glory. Hebrews chapter 13 tells us that we ought to entertain strangers because in doing so, some of us have entertained angels. Okay, we might have entertained an angel, but we probably haven't known it as an angel. But when an angel comes in all their glory that God has given to them, they are, they are a person greatest fear at that moment. You remember in Luke chapter 1 when the angel comes and visits Mary? The first thing that the angel says to Mary is do not be afraid. One of the first things that comes out of his mouth do not be afraid. Remember in, in Luke's gospel later on in the nativity story God answered, God gives the announcement of his son's birth to some lowly shepherds out in the field. And I looked for the tape this week that we had of the Easter, uh, the Christmas experience, and I couldn't find it because they had such a great clip on there. They had a great clip of this angel coming. We didn't see the angel, but we saw the reaction of the shepherds who were terrified at that moment. The heavens opened up, the angels apparently were above them, and their response was terror at that point. And then awe at that point. You remember when Jesus arose from the grave? He was guarded. So no one would get into that tomb because the word had come out that this Jesus was going to arise from the dead in three days. And so the, so the Roman officials put guards on the tomb. Don't let anybody in and take that body out because if that happens, the falsehood of that happening is going to be worse than what we're dealing with now. So they put Roman guards, temple guards, upon the tomb and there they were stationed until the three days were over. Except Jesus had an appointment to come back out. And when he came out, he came out with the announcement that he was alive and it was done so by angels. And the scripture says, when they saw the angels, these tough guards fell like dead men on the ground. They weren't dead. They would go back and report this story, but they fell like dead men before fear of an angel. The first reason we have a hard time correlating to this passage is we've never seen an angel that way in our life. The second reason we have a hard time understanding this passage is we have never seen Jesus in the flesh. We haven't seen Jesus in the flesh. To us, he is God's only son. To them, he was a carpenter. We have not seen him. For us to see him today, we see him in all of his glory. We see him as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. But if you would have walked in Palestine in that time, you'd have walked in Nazareth at that time, you'd have walked in Jerusalem at that time, you would have probably run into Jesus. Who is that? I think that's a prophet. He is pretty well known. I heard that he, uh, he heals the sick. I hear he cures the lame. 
even heard he raised somebody from the dead. You see, we haven't seen Jesus in the flesh. We don't relate to him that way. We relate to him in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And even in the first chapter of the book of Acts when he ascends back into heaven. But we have not related to him in the flesh. We relate to him as the scripture says in the whole that he is who he is. The savior of the world who has come to save us from our sins. The also the Jewish people understood this about angels. Angels, according to Scripture, were the ones who delivered the law. The law of God was brought by his messengers for the people who were of God's own choosing. Three different places, Galatians 3.19, Acts 7.53, Deuteronomy 33, verse 2. If you want to hold your finger here in Hebrews, let's go back over to Galatians and let's just look at that. After 1st and 2nd Corinthians is Galatians. <laughs> Galatians 3.19. What then was the purpose of the law? It was because of transgressions. Until the seed to whom the promise referred had come, the law that was put in effect through angels by a mediator. The angels somehow were a part of God's messaging team, his servants who brought this law, probably not the Ten Commandments because we see in Deuteronomy how that was written, but they brought the law of God to the people of God and they were highly esteemed in the time that the, the author of this writes. So here we are in Hebrews in chapter 1 and the author is going to make this argument. Jesus is greater than angels. And he does so with four ways in which he gives us proof that Jesus is greater than angels. And the first one is, Jesus is greater than angels because of his name. Because of his name. Look at it in verse 4. <clears throat> so, he, which is Jesus, became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son. Today I have become your father. No one, none of the angels, and don't get mixed up with some of the, the doctrine of some, some religions out there that say that Jesus and Satan are angels. There's no truth to that whatsoever. Angel is not for Jesus. Yes, Satan has an angel and he is a, he is a demon, but he is not a brother to Jesus. It is a false statement put out by false religions. Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. There is no other. And so we see him here. He has inherited a name, and that name is not a formal name as in Jesus or in John or in Mike. It is the name Son of God. To which of the angels did God ever say, You are my Son. You are the Son of God of God. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. <laughs> Jesus Christ is the son of God. Higher than the greatest of angels. He is so much more than angels could ever be. The problem with that is Philippians chapter 2 tells us that when Jesus Christ came and he left heaven and he came to earth, he uses the phrase that he became a little lower than the angels. Why did he do that? And so that he would be like you and me. 
we would be able to relate to him. God came down from heaven, down to earth, and he made his son a little lower than the angels for just a small period of time. You know what else? There's no place in scripture where this name that is above all names, the son of God, is given to him anywhere before the New Testament begins. In the Old Testament, he was not referred to as the Son of God. In the Old Testament, he was God. He is God today. He was God when he came here upon the earth. He was God, but he was not referred to as the Son of God because he was God. When he came here upon the earth, a new title was given to him, a new name was given to him as the Son of God. And now we're able to see that in this, that it puts him higher above any of the angels. Even though for a short period of time, he was made like you and me. Fully man, but always fully God. Second thing we see in this passage is that Jesus is greater than the angels because of his worship, his superior, than the worship of anyone else. Look at verse 6. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Let all God's angels worship him. Now, if angels were above Jesus... Why would God say, let all the angels worship this one that's lower than you? No, it's the other way, way around. It is God's son who is here and the angels are lower than him. And so he instructs all the angels that he has made to worship the son of God. And that instruction is for you and for me as well. You and I are to worship this son of God. We're not to worship the angels. Never to worship the angels. We don't pray to angels. We pray to the Son of God who is the mediator between us and the Father. The scripture says that he intercedes on our behalf between him and the Father. And I don't understand. I, don't, I can't put all the Trinity together. My mind is, is limited in very many ways, but it's strictly limited in that. I can't put together the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons but one God. But you know what? The scripture teaches that. And while we can't understand it completely here upon this earth, we have to trust it because each one in scripture is listed as God. The Father is, is, is listed as God. The Son is listed as God. The Holy Spirit is listed as God. We come from that to the idea that he is indeed a triune God. It's interesting the angels know this. The angels know that they are to worship the Son of God. And they also know that we're not supposed to. John the Apostle, in Revelation, in the book of Revelation, has a, has a celestial tour. And he has got an angel as a tour guide. And he is going around and he is seeing the great city at the end of Revelation. He has seen the great city, and he has seen the home of those who are gone before us, uh, a new heaven and a new earth that is coming one day. A home for them and for us one day who are in Christ. But you know what? When we get to Revelation 22, John does something, and the angel scolds him for it. Turn, if you would, over to the last book of the last, the last chapter of the last book. Chapter 22 of Revelation. And in verse 1, And the angel showed me the river of water of life, as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. 
And on each side of the river stood a tree of life, bearing twelve crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. Then go down to verse 6. And the angel said to me, These words are trustworthy and true. The Lord, the God of the spirits of the prophets, sent his angel to show, uh, sent his angel to show his servants the things that must soon take place. Behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of the prophecy in this book. And I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. And when I heard them and, and heard and seen them, I fell down at the feet of the angel who was showing them to me. But this angel said to me, do not do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers, the prophets, and of all who keep the words of the book. Worship God. Don't you worship me because I am instructed to worship God as well. It's interesting in this passage that he says, don't worship me, worship God. Third point, Jesus is greater because of his name, the Son of God, because of his worship, he is worshipped above all things, especially by angels and those who are wise here upon the earth. And because of his title, in speaking to the angels, he says, verse 7, he makes these angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But about his son, he says, look, your throne, O oh God, will last forever and ever. He says that about his son. You, O oh God, your throne will last forever and ever. And the righteousness will be your scepter, uh, will be the scepter of your kingdom. He calls him God. God speaks of his son as God. If that's not enough proof for some denominations or some sects out in the world that says that Jesus Christ is not the son of God, that verse to me is one of the many that prove that he is. God himself is calling him son, his son, your throne, O God, will last forever and righteousness will be the scepter of your kingdom. He is to be worshipped as God. Because he's anointed as God. He's been anointed to be God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah who has come. The prophet Isaiah said that there's one who is coming, who is going to set his people free. He's going to break the chains. He's going to break the yoke. He's going to heal the sick. He's going to give sight to the blind. And when Jesus comes... The beginning of his ministry, he sets down in his hometown. He comes back home. Good, good guy comes back home, starting a ministry. Turn with me, if you would, over to Luke's gospel. Luke chapter 4. He comes back, and when he comes back, he has a message for his hometown people. Chapter 4, verse 16. He that is speaking of Jesus, go back to 14. Jesus went up to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor 
And he has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and to reclaim sight for the blind and to release the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. A prophecy that says there is a Messiah who is coming, a Savior of the world who is coming, who is going to break the chains of sin, who is going to heal the blind and bring forth new life to those who are captive and he said, today, in your hearing, the Spirit of the Lord is on me. So who is he? He is great. He is great because of the name that's been given to him. His name is the Son of God. He's great because of the, of the title that is given which we just saw the title that he is, he is God. And the one in between is he is great because he alone is to be worshipped as God. One more. Jesus is greater than the angels because his destiny is superior to the angels. His destiny is superior. Verse 10 says, In the beginning, O Lord, look, in the beginning, O Lord, who is it that says it? He says it. God says it. In the beginning, O Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe, like a garment. They will be changed. But you will remain the same and your years will never end. In other words, you were worshipped before things were made, before the creation of the world, and you're going to be worshipped afterwards. Look at the very next line. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies, and make your enemies a footstool at your feet? And the very last line says that angels are ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation. We could go into that in another message, but that tells us that each one of God's people who are going into the kingdom must have called upon the name of the Lord as their Savior, has a ministering angel who is in your life somewhere. I remember one time hearing Chuck Swindoll preach. He said, if you could, if you could see with, with heavenly eyes what is going on in this room right now. There are angels that are moving back and forth in this place. Kind of freaked me out at the time I heard that. But you know what? They're just servants of God. And why wouldn't a servant of God come and be in the place of his people when they worship? He is superior because of his destiny. He is going to sit at the right hand of the Father until all of the enemies of God are put at his footstool. You ever been in a, in a lazy boy and you got the lazy boy part that you rock back and your legs get to sit on? Before they had a lazy boy though, they had footstools, okay? Some of you remember footstools. My grandma would make a footstool out of high sea cans that were about that tall. Had the coolest one. I loved going to her house and putting my feet on the footstool. Okay? It wasn't the chair where I sat, except when I was little. Okay? It was just a footstool. You see, God is going to be seated on the throne, and his son is going to be there at his right hand, and God is going to put all his enemies at his feet, and his feet are going to rest upon them. That is a powerful God, worthy of our worship today. And you know what? Here's the, here's the conclusion of this. The way you see Jesus Christ today makes all the difference in the way in which you live. The way in which you see Jesus Christ today is the way in which you will live. 
If you are a great follower of him, it will depend upon how you see him. There is a direct correlation as to whether you choose to obey him or to do your own thing. And that correlation is this, how you see Jesus. See, because if Jesus were to come and to stand here beside me, you might wonder how you would react. You might say, I would stand and praise and I would lift my hands and I would sing. I doubt it. You might say, certainly I would, I would, uh, I would point to him and would say, move over, pastor. There is the son of God and you don't need to be on the same level as he. No, you wouldn't. You see, I've been in the presence of God, and you have been in the presence of God. And there's sometimes when we're in the presence of God, the things that we thought we would do are not the things that we do. Because when we're in his presence, you know what? Things change. I'll tell you what I think I would do. I think I would fall on my face before him. I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, there's a song that says, you know, I'm going to sing and I'm going to dance. Am I going to, you know, am I even going to have words to be able to express? Am I going to dance for you, Jesus? I think I'm going to fall on my face before him as one who is unworthy, but one who is worthy to be praised because he has made me worthy. See, there's nothing in me that merits that I would be a son of God. And there's nothing in you that merits that you would be a son or a daughter of God. We're going to see that later on in Hebrews. You know, Jesus is not afraid to call us his brother or sister. That is an amazing statement. We'll get to it a little later. But when he comes in all of his glory, we'll not say, hey, brother, Jesus, let's go to the Father. I think we will fall on our face in reverent worship of him. And maybe he'll reach down and he will lift us up and say, you are mine. Not because of what you have done, but because of what I did when I died on the cross for you. You see how you see him will decide tomorrow morning whether or not you spend time with him this week. I was thinking about it, the song that the choir sang, or the praise team sang that I didn't know you were gonna sing. <clears throat> Great song. I thought, you know, this song probably lasts a whole lot less than five minutes. A whole lot less than five minutes to be able to sing about seeking his face. And I thought, you know, there's 12, 12 five-minute sections, I think, in an hour, right? That would make there to be 288 five-minute sections in a whole day. 288 times tomorrow, you will have the opportunity to spend five minutes in the presence of God that will change your life. If you make that a regular habit in your life to spend five minutes for him, not asking for what he is going to give you, just seeking him and getting to know him. Because I tell you what, the more you know him, the difference in your life will be astronomically growing as you grow in knowledge and love for him. Because when you see him and when you know him, you will want to be more like him. He wants you to be. That's a challenge for us, isn't it? If I have a low view of him, you'll say tomorrow it's no big deal. What I do or what I don't do. Low view. You have a low view of him. He will be a small part of your life in this coming week challenge for us is he wants to be Lord not a five minutes tomorrow 
but of 24 hours tomorrow of your life. But it begins when you come into his presence and you begin to meet with him.